All right, guys, happy Wednesday. Um, it is that time again for the Shift Success podcast. And this week we have uh, a lovely Shift Success co one member who has actually been on the show before, <laughs> um, the lovely Lorna Reeves. Um, for those who don't know who Lorna is, I bet you do, but just in case, um, Lorna uh, used to work for the Metropolitan Police. I think she worked for about 15 years due to you know being stressed and just wanting to change their life. She decided to... Uh, jump ship whilst building her business, which is something I actually don't encourage. I think you should build a business, um, then transition into full-time business. So you've got a safety net. But for Lorna, the loose unit that she is, she decided to <laughs> jump and build a business at the same time. And, um, you know, five years on now, uh, she has made a phenomenal success of herself. She's launched multiple businesses. She's a multiple award-winning entrepreneur. Uh, and also she's a, a phenomenal coach for us at Shift Success as well. Um, so Lorna, welcome back. Hi, I can't believe it's been nearly three years since we sat and talked the last time. Yeah, I know, right? Three years since the podcast and yeah, five years you've been in business, right? Yep. And and just for reference, I also don't recommend jumping before you've built your business. Um, yeah, it's not the easiest way to do it. Um, but ha, you live and learn. Hey, you made it, right? Yeah. You kind of got no option when you've burnt your boats. You kind of have to conquer the island. You've, you've got no other option. Yeah, that's there's one way to go. It's either die or succeed. Um, <laughs> Lorna, since yep. we last spoke three years ago, how do you summarize the last three years? Bonkers, whistle stop, and forced to grow. Why? Because so last time we spoke was pre-COVID. So mm. my and my weddings was ticking over, starting to grow, getting some traction, started winning awards, making a few ripples in the wedding industry, which is exactly what it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. My and my events had been born kind of organically with certain people not too far away saying, hey, you organize stuff. Can you give me a hand? Um, and I think the last time we spoke, I was booked out for the entire year um, with face to face events. So literally every week we had events running um, and then obviously COVID hit. So um, I remember saying to my wife we were on holiday our first holiday since I'd left the job um and just looking at her saying I don't think we're going to have a business in by the time we get home from this holiday if this COVID thing kicks off like it's supposed to I'm not going to have a business if we can't do face to face what the hell are we going to do mm. and that kind of prompted the whole 72 hours of no sleep just learn everything you can about doing stuff online and then I remember having conversations with people like you um, and some of our other clients and saying, you know what, let's not cancel. Let's not see how this thing pans out. Let's take the ball by the horns and actually take control of it. And we can still do online. We can still do interactive, immersive, impactive events. We're just going to have to do them differently. Um, and it kind of spiraled from there, really. We flipped everything to online. And I'm so glad we did because obviously COVID stuck around for nearly 18 months before we could get back to um face-to-face -face stuff and we kind of grew way faster than I thought we were going to um it went from me in March 2020 to me and four by September 2020 um so just so we could manage the number of online events that we were doing um and yeah we've kind of carried on gaining momentum from there we've we've slowed the trajectory of growth a little bit which is quite nice because I'm now actually building the foundations of the stuff that we just had to do it and wing it you know and kind of say yes and figure it out um, which was amazing and we built a lot of traction from just giving content away every time I figured out how to do something new I threw it onto LinkedIn or I put it on YouTube um, you know this is what Zoom has just released. This is what Microsoft has just released. This is how you can use it to save your business. So we really wanted as many businesses to thrive um, out of the back of COVID, not do what the, the kind of pundits and commentators were saying that everything is going to keel over and die. Actually, how do we stop that from happening? How do we empower other businesses, whether they use us or not? How do we keep this whole um, economy growing? Because ultimately, if all the business owners stop doing events and 
their business is closed down we haven't got any business any clients either so it's actually in our benefit just to share as much as we could for free as possible and that was kind of our growth plan for nearly nine months um, and it worked we're still getting referrals now from people saying oh, I saw your video on dot 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 um, can we have a conversation or I attended one of your free webinars back in 2020 and liked what you did can we have a chat about supporting us so it was really a time of having to adapt and having to adapt quickly and I can be the world's worst overthinker but I think when you haven't got the option you can't overthink it because you need to do it or fail um you just kind of get on with it you get really inventive really creative mm. um and yeah that's been the last three years really wow wow yeah. that's amazing that <laughs> sounds like a, it sounds like a whirlwind I know COVID it was. <laughs> knocked, uh, knocked a few businesses to the side and I can remember us speaking about a few things when you was on holiday with your with your wife and you were hearing all this news about this this COVID thing coming coming out because I'll admit, I, you know, I'm openly admit, I thought it was going to blow over. I thought it was just the news. I'm very anti-news as it is anyway. And I was like, yeah, it's going to blow over. It's fine. When did, when did you realize, was it kind of, when you heard of COVID, did you know deep down like, oh shit, we need to change now? Or was it almost, I'm putting preventative measures in place just in case? Like, where was your mindset with COVID when, it, when you first heard about it? It was kind of a bit of both. So we started hearing about it in the January, I remember, um, but it was, you know, few and far between and it wasn't actually damaging that many people. And, it, you know, it was really played down by the media. Yeah. And I think the fact that we were in France and they were closing France literally the day we left, that was it. No restaurants, no hotels, nothing was open. And just having a chat with the hotel owner and, him, and them saying, you know, we've been shut down for a month. Our business won't survive if we're shut down for two months. That's how close to the wind a lot of businesses are running in terms of their, you know, their profit lines and what cash flow they've got in the bank. Yeah. And, we're, and that kind of made me sit and think, OK, well, we can survive for six months. We've got that kind of cash in the bank that we can tick over for six months if we can't do face to face events. But that doesn't really wash, you know, everybody's got these events in the pipeline and mm. and people like yourself, you have this had back then this program that was running month to month and it was about delivering to your clients mm. every month. Y yeah. You can't put that on hold for six months. You can't say to people, oh, you know, I know you want to change your life, but you're just going to have to wait a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't work. So it's yeah. about um, continuation. How do we continue that? How do we develop? contingencies for that until it does blow over yep. um, until until it does mean that we can get back to normal and what we thought normal was going to be yeah um so yeah it was a bit of contingency planning um and i think looking back it really forced everybody to change i call it the kind of fourth industrial revolution we would never have switched to the online space as fast if it hadn't been for covid yeah um, you know, it's changed industry massively. It's changed recruitment enormously. Mm. The next generation of people, it's quite possible that they will never have an office job. Yeah, yeah. Um, and agree. that's that's you know, bonkers. We would never have got to that space if it weren't for the fact that it was forced. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting time. Um, I'm so glad we moved as quickly as we did and when we did. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just an, it enabled us to grow. We are one of the businesses that, unfortunately, and it's awful to say, actually did all right after COVID. Yeah, um, yeah. That's so. okay to say. So we, we, I think, well, here's the thing. It, it, it comes down to the individual. And there's a lot of people who are stuck in their ways who weren't open to change because they had done something for a certain amount of time. And those businesses, unfortunately, didn't do well. They They should have you know, took action on it sooner. And I also found as well through studying is that a lot of the larger companies couldn't move quick enough, hence why they collapsed. Um, when you started, you know, putting out content to do with online and Zoom and because I know you helped us, you know, quite a bit to transition to online fully and we still do it today. Like it's not, we've not gone back. We, we do it. It's actually turned out for the better. Um, but for you, when you start putting out content on LinkedIn or, you know, wherever your target customers are, did you get any kind of, 
you know, did you get any like backlash in terms of no, it can't be run, events can't be run as good, or you know, there's too many things will go wrong? Because I can imagine there's quite a lot of education that needs to go into it for for someone who's been stuck in the ways for so many years doing run, running events. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's and it's threefold. I think the first time we started putting content out, people were so desperate. It was almost like throwing out life fests. Right. And people were grabbing onto whatever information that they could get. Mm. Um, and we got people from like CEOs saying, thanks, this is awesome. I've passed it to my team mm -hmm. to little baby administrators saying I've taken this information I've given it to my boss it's been really useful thank you you know kind of everybody was trying to clamor for information in order to survive in those early days mm -hmm. then when things started to settle probably around the first Christmas time a lot of people were saying actually we're going to hold off on our you know our flagship event of the year or our big conference of the year because it'll all go back to normal soon um, and it's those people that have really struggled now mm -hmm. if you are not shifting with the times people are learning differently people have got um, different preferences now the online space has become this place where you're globally accessible in a way that you perhaps weren't before covid and then actually to say oh we're going to wait and we're going to go back to normal you're excluding this massive market that you could be speaking to that you could be connecting with so mm. it's actually the people that jumped on board with it and are still on board with it that are growing um that are growing hugely i still get a little bit of pushback primarily from all the speakers that say i much prefer speaking in the face-to-face -face realm i get much more connection from people and i just think okay you that might be your style but i'd also suggest that you could benefit from some training in the online space and um, you know the way that you use technology even like just some of the buttons you press to change your view can make you more connected mm. you know are you really utilizing the space around you or are you stuck with your head and shoulders in this box mm. are you transitioning and using different pieces of kit how are you um integrating apps and actually making your event lively how are you making it interactive how are you encouraging that feedback from an audience whether it's in a room of 200 whether it's 3000 people online or whether it's a blend of the two it's a real art to be able to do that i think the speakers that don't adapt and don't change their skill set and develop their skill set will continue to struggle yeah. going forward yeah yeah completely agree so when when you start getting yourself out there and you know all this is happening i just heard that you mentioned that you're missing a large potential of market so did you position your content at the time as that actually, this is an opportunity. Yes, this is very painful and no one wants this, but actually you can have potential upside here if you make the change to online. Because, you know, in a room, maybe you can fit 100, 200, 300, 400, you know, 1,000. But online, it, the, the, it's limitless, right? So is that how you positioned it? or? Yeah, it was a mixture of, um, yep, you can suddenly, you're not a local business. Suddenly mm -hmm. you're not a national business. You are a global business. And, mm -hmm. and actually we, some of our biggest clients are in the US because we can do what we do for them from here. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, that's huge. Um, we also pitched it that this is financially beneficial. So stop paying 10,000, 20,000 pounds for a room in a fancy hotel mm. with a couple of dry cheese sandwiches and some tea and coffee. <laughs> when you can do it online, even with event support like us um, and some software, you can do it for a quarter of the price and all of that money goes to your bottom line. The, the, the content still is the same, is still stellar content. You can still charge the same. You're still getting that interaction and that return on investment. But that money that you would be spending on venues has gone straight to your bottom line. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's your bonus money, if you like. So you could make a 5% profit. You're now making a 75% profit. That's the kind of um, return on investment you could be making in the online space. Amazing. So obviously you're reaching more customers potentially. You get to still sell from stage if your speakers do sell. Um, you're reducing the cost outlay. So again, that goes straight to your bottom line. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm assuming as well, because it's all recorded, you can actually create assets that can create more sales or can be marketed in a, in a way to bring on more customers. Is that right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And the the after the after effect is the bit that I'm finding a lot of my clients are not capitalizing on at the moment. Mm. So we record everything as standard anyway. Mm. Then what do you do with it? You know, stick it behind a membership portal and and sell it as an online course. Most conferences you could chunk up into sections, mm. um, or um, give it as um, product for prospect collateral to people. Mm. We had this talk recently that we think this would be really useful to you. Or you can continue to sell tickets for your conference well after the conference is finished because yeah. people can then access it in their own time. So there's so many ways and so many people are still leaving money on the table um, by not capitalizing on those assets afterwards. So and it, it, it's the shift to online is vast and I don't think we'll see the ben- full benefits of it for a few years yet. If you're a sustainable company that are committing to, you know, we're going to be a B Corp company or we're going to, um, we're going to be carbon neutral by dot, dot, dot. You need to be running online events. Mm. You know, the carbon footprint of getting people to travel, fly, stay in a hotel, do the conference and then travel home again. Um, yeah. It's just enormous. So doing it online or hybrid, you're yeah. going to have a real impact in that sphere as well. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. When you when you obviously were do, doing in person live events to the transition to going online and, and learning about this that kind of area of events, um, what are some of the challenges that you faced in you know um, not so much educating the audience but also actually you learning a skill set to make sure that these are running smoothly? You know, what are kind of some that popped to mind straight away for you? um getting a desk big enough for all the equipment um <laughs> but it, some of it is the practicalities so knowing so I always start with a vision this is what I want the event to do how in the hell do I make that happen mm. um so buying bits of kit uh, production software um, production hardware how do I then make that work a lot of the time it was time to learn um, and I didn't have the time to learn. I didn't have months to teach people how to use um, software, how to use production pieces, lots of it. We had to, I'd sit someone on my team next to me and say, right, I'm going to run an event. You're going to watch me. Let me know if you've got any questions. And right. that's how we had to train because we were moving so quickly. Mm-hmm. We didn't have the time to sit and learn and play. I was learning how to use kit at like two and three in the morning for an event in two days time. So that I can be comfortable enough on it and it becomes muscle memory for me Mm. so that I can walk into an event completely assured and completely comfortable. And it's not necessarily how to use it because that's all in instruction manuals. It's what the do you do when it goes wrong? Yeah. Yeah. How do how do you fix it? How do you troubleshoot it? How do you keep the event online? And what are the fallbacks? So I think you're sitting and thinking about what are my contingencies if zoom stops working what do i do about that if um you know a couple of the people can't get into the event whilst we're online how do we resolve that how do we um, resolve those issues whilst we're still running smoothly um so i think the one of the biggest challenges was time yeah and and you've got no one to learn from because everyone else is in the same boat everybody else is still trying to figure this out yeah so it was reaching out to people maybe that have done things in the industry slightly differently. So um, reaching out to people that are TV producers or uh, movie producers and editors, because they use a lot of this kit day to day, but, you know, to produce ITV news or BBC one. So then saying to them, okay, teach me how this switchboard works. Mm -hmm. So if I can understand that, I can figure out how to produce an event and then push it out to people online with the switchboard in front of me in a home office rather than BBC TV studios. So trying to figure out from other people how to adapt the pieces of kit because no one else has figured it out yet and we're all kind of swimming upstream together. Mm. Did you find the people, I think, uh, is it California, Sacramento rings a bell, like you work with, with clients there. Did you find that people in America were more open to the fact of having things online compared to your English clients or were they kind of setting their ways worse? They were, they were worse. I think they're so used to working trans America. So, Mm. you know, they would think nothing of flying from Seattle to California for a one day event Mm. in person. That was kind of expected. Whereas Mm. I think in Europe, we were already using a lot of video software. We, we have a lot of companies that already have, 
an office in London, an office in Dublin, an office in Paris, mm. and they're used to working that way. Mm. Whereas I think Americans are much more used to traveling to make those meetings happen. Um, and they were much more in the boat of, well, we'll wait until it passes. We'll, we'll wait until it's okay again. And the US was one of the last countries to open its borders again. Mm. So they were one of the um, one of the last people we could actually go to physically. Um, so yeah, it was definitely the forward thinking companies, the ones that are thinking about the future, the ones that are thinking about where are we going to be and where our clients going to be in five years time. Let's kind of get ahead of that curve that, oh. that have done well. I love it. And obviously you've got a team now. I know you, you managed a large team while she was in the police uh, many years ago now, um, but now you've got your own team uh, as the leader of your organization, your company. Um, what have been some of the challenges for you in, in hiring, uh, especially during this period where there's a massive transition to, to, to going online? You mentioned already like training, like they literally had to watch you and take notes, et cetera. But what are the challenges we found in, in hiring some, some amazing people? Sometimes I think amazing people don't realize they're amazing. Therefore, okay. it makes so them yeah, it makes them difficult to find. Mm. Um, I would put out so so we're really strong advocates for. I don't necessarily believe that academic qualifications makes you the best employee. Yeah. So I was really passionate about developing our recruitment system for valuing people with life skills people with um you know the soft skills the aptitude to learn the passion and the drive to want to be part of a team to the ability to be able to juggle multiple priorities um and not necessarily they don't need to necessarily need a degree in event production to be able to do that you just haven't learned that particular skill yet yeah how do you bring that out to someone or how do you find that as an employer speaking to them yeah, um, I think you can get a really good steer in that first conversation um, and making your interview questions open enough that someone can bring their personality to the situation yeah. um, and making them comfortable enough that they can bring their whole selves to the situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're really clear from the outset about um, our vision, vision and values. Um, you know, one of our values is we don't work with dickheads and that's clients <laughs> or team members. Yep. Um, and we say that from the outset. And, and I think the team really support that. And I'm, I'm a big advocate and I say it from the beginning that if you want to develop and you want to learn, I'll help you get there. Um, but I'm also not going to spoon feed you. You know, I will give you everything you need to do a good job. I'll let you know when you don't. Um, but if you turn around and say to me, Lorna, I'm really interested in this new piece of software. I think it could be really valuable. Um, this is how I can see it working for our clients. There's a course on it and it's 250 quid. Can I go on it? Mm. I'll absolutely support the team. If they're going to you know, um, be passionate enough to want to continue to learn and want to continue to grow, I'm a full advocate for that. Um, mm. and my, if I develop people and they grow, even more and get even more skills they're only going to add to my client base they're only going to add to the company skill set mm. and I think having conversations with people um, in interview and keeping it as a conversation is really important um, allowing them to be real with you to a certain extent um, yeah you can put a few kind of standardized questions in so you've got some something quantifiable that you could compare two people um, to each other but I think listing out skills that are important, life skills that are important, as well as you need to be able to use Excel and you need to be comfortable with, you know, the Google platform, um, I think is critical. Mm. Um, and and we've built a team and they all bring something different and they're all different to me, which I think as a as a leader is a really strong place to be. It's also not the natural place. You naturally want to employ people like you but that's where the rub comes and then if but if you don't naturally spot certain things like I'm quite a high level person in when I get to the real detail I can do detail but mm. not for long periods of time so yeah. I'm not great at proofreading um, yeah. I'll skim read a document I'll get what I need from it but I'm not great at proofreading I need somebody that loves the detail and loves to sit in the detail for ages and ages yeah yeah. Um, I need somebody that's going to catch those things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hiring people that are not the same as you yeah. is, um, is really 
important and something to really watch out for when you're hiring. Yeah, that, I completely agree. Sometimes like as well, you mentioned like showing a bit of personality or allowing them to show a bit of personality. And where I've got things wrong in the past is that I've actually clicked with someone like really well as a friend, like, oh, I'd love to go for a drink with this person. But actually they're not the best person to perform in the business. And I've made hiring mistakes based on that because you know, I think as entrepreneurs, you get lovey-dovey with someone, you like to get this person into your business because they're awesome, but actually can they do the skill set required to, to cover that area of the business? So what you said there is, is, is bang on the money. Um, you also said like, you know, one of the things that you kind of explained to your team members is that you don't want, you don't want to speak, speak, you to support them, but you don't want to spoon feed them with stuff. And I think that's important too, because you've almost got to create other leaders in your, in your company. Um, but what you talk about there, I'm assuming it is initiative, like mm-hmm. um, problems happen all the time in business. And one of the things I, I tell, you know, my team members is like, if you come to me with a problem, you please do come to me with a solution too. Like, mm-hmm. I don't just want to hear the problem because then I become the bottleneck, right? I've got to be the one who fixes it. I want you to create your own solution and then let's talk through those solutions um for you and your business and when something goes wrong is there kind of a process that you go through or is there um is it a understanding of what went wrong and how to fix asap you know talk to me through your process and how you resolve it yeah so because we are in events nine times out of ten if something happens Mm. it's happening right now and it needs to be fixed right now otherwise wow. it's going that is wrong pressure right <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Um, there's not really a chance to have a 20 minute conversation about what's going on and so so the team know that if there's a problem they have the ability and my full backing to fix it mm-hmm. and then they'll let me know at the end or um during the event you know something's gone wrong here this is what i've done to fix it and i say great is it back up online you yeah. know do you need anything from me no, we'll talk about it afterwards. And and we do and then sit and have a debrief. Okay, what, what went wrong? Can we, you know, t- technically find out what has gone wrong and how do we put a patch on that to stop it from happening again? Um, or is it a training need? Is it actually, I didn't realize that that bit of kit did that thing and I've pressed the wrong button. Um, so, okay, let's go back to basics. Let's revisit that. Or have we done something and it's now a documented process in the system, mm. but actually the, the process needs to change because it hasn't kept up with the tech or it hasn't kept up with the most efficient way of doing the thing. Um, so it needs to be done. But m- my team know if they something goes wrong and they fix it with the best intentions and with the information they've got at the time, I'll back them to the hilt. Yeah. Um, you know, because that's all you can do when you're spinning multiple plates, you catch them with whatever you can um, yeah. in in the moment. Um, so, yeah, there's there's is a review process. And a couple of my team have come and said, hey, Lorna, we do this and we have this system in process in place. One that doesn't work for me, you know, maybe they're um, neurodiverse or, you know, maybe they've got a different learning style. Can we adapt it? and do it in this way instead or did you know that there's a better way of doing this and I you know I created the business myself from my perspective and I am happy to learn if there is a better more efficient way of doing something or a piece of kit that cuts out 27 steps that will make it faster by all means speak up and let's let's see how we can weave that in uh, um, how we can make the business better as a whole um, I love that farming the gold nuggets from the rest of the team it's not just all on me yeah so you so you basically you're incentivizing hey guys if you got an idea to make this business better or this process or this system please come to me because we're in this together kind of thing right mm-hmm. yeah oh, and yeah. and not not even come to me if it's an admin thing and yeah. something needs to change in the processes figure it out amongst yourselves just yeah. let me know what you've done to change it got you fantastic so you're not doing the old way all the time right got you okay um you mentioned um what are your values is actually not to work with dickheads which she thinks very refreshing and that goes with clients and uh of course your, your team members right mm-hmm. um i want to talk about clients have you have you had any red flag clients where you thought this has got to end or or in fact you've not even started working with them because you just can see the red flags standing out talk to me about a few of those yeah, hundred percent. More so in the early days than mm. now, um, because in the early days, a sale's a sale, and you need the cash coming in. That's yeah. the long and short of it. Is to survive, we need the cash. Yeah. And 
I'd, I'm sure you feel the same. In fact, I know that you will. But you know, when you speak to someone and you agree a price and then you put the phone down and you go, mm. oh, I'm not sure about this. Yeah. But yeah. you know what? They've paid up front. We've, we've got an agreement and we'll roll with it. Yeah. And then at every single turn, that person has been a pain in the butt. Mm. You know, that person probably makes up a tiny bit of your revenue stream yep. that takes up 80% of your time. Yes. <laughs> um, yet the people that pay the chunky money just allow you to get on with your job, um, allow you to do what you do best. Um, and they are happy to sit back and wait for the thing to happen because they've got full confidence in you. So, yes, in the beginning, a few times I didn't listen to my gut. And mm. usually it is a gut feel. You probably can't say why. Yeah. Um, but now it's a bit of a choice in either. I'll chat with the team and say, I've got, this is the client that I've got. This is what they want. I think they're going to be a pain. Um, and the team will say, well, stick an extra zero on the quote and see what happens. Yeah. And if they say yes, at least it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, um, and if it's nine times out of 10, though, I'll say, do you know what? We are not the company for you. Here's yeah. a list of people that might be better to help you. Yeah. Um, or, or I'll just, when that particular event ends, we just go our separate ways and say, you know what, well, it was a good event. It, we, we all got what we wanted from it. Um, but in future, you might want to consider these people. Yeah. Um, so there's there's ways and means of managing it, but I think you've got to go with your gut as, and and not chase the cash because that person will absorb all of your headspace. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a great lesson, actually, because as I think also at beginning stages as well, it's like you're trying to gather experience and also depending on business you're in you want to help everyone it's like you're in that state of yeah i'm gonna i want to solve this problem for you i want to help you and that kind of thing and even though you've got those gut feelings of oh this is this is gonna this is gonna be painful or or, or this is something's not right my gut's telling me you're still in that mindset of i want to help these people because they're in a bad situation i want to help them um but what i found which you quite rightly you know said you know work we work with hundreds of people now it's like you can spot the common red flags amongst people and and we you know i tell my team look if if these are these flags are tripped in our conversations with people like triggered almost then politely decline them and 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 refer them elsewhere in fact we've we've made um you know and this is for everyone listening is that not everyone should be sold to as well so like we've we've had some red flag clients in the previously who we've had to let go. Um, and as soon as we brought them on, they've been a pain to, to, to work with. And then as soon as you do say, hey, look, we're not for you, things can then go sour. So, you know, what Lorne is saying there and, and something I'm saying too, is that, yes, we understand you might be starting your business and, and wanting revenue and wanting sales and you want to help people and make a difference, make an impact. But you've almost got to protect your own peace as well. And you know, being in business a long time, you'll mature to that and realize actually that red flag client is taking more from you than the sale made from that customer. Um, but on the hindsight, I believe too, you've got to have those types of clients to actually say, I'm not dealing with that type of person again. So it's like a catch 22. You've, you've got to go through the pain to go, ah, I'm not having that again. This is the standard. Would you agree? Yeah, here are my boundaries. And I think sometimes if you haven't experienced the pain, you're yeah. not necessarily as robust with your boundaries. And what you say about not everyone should be sold to is so right. I can remember having calls with people in the early days of business and mm. just me being not desperate, but the, you know, the objective being for them to buy. The yeah. expectation is at the end of this phone call, you will buy my thing. Hmm. Whereas actually at the end of the phone call, I should be saying, I really like this person. I think I can do something for them. And they should be saying, I really like Lorna and her team. I really think we could get something and it's mutually beneficial hmm. without thinking, right, I've sold to them and they're going to say yes it's been a hard sell and a hard push mm. and I'm not sure I really like them that much and they're going to be a pain, but I've got a sale. I've got a win out of it. You know, that's, that's my numbers done for today. Mm. Actually that first call is for both of you to yeah. see if you're a good fit, not just for them to want to work with you. You need to check that you actually want to work with that person as well. 
so so true and, and that's like a common misconception like i mean we, we've just discussed it you know when we started out you know our businesses it's like you try and get every customer but as you mature the sales dynamic actually changes it's like do i want to work with this person and can i help them and you know one thing we do now at shift success is that we have selection criteria so at the beginning stages we never had selection criteria now we have selection criteria and kind of a process like an initial call and then a a, a longer in-depth call as well as the selection criteria through that and also we have little tests so um you know, we we send links and resources to certain people who are booked in for calls. And if they don't watch or consume those links by the time they attend the last kind of strategy session with our team, we say, hey, look, we can't help you. Because if they can't simply take a simple action of watching something or doing something, well, they're not going to be able to build a business with our support. Mm-hmm. So we're good. That's what that's what we do. Right. So, um, yeah, I think making sure you actually want to help them is important and also maybe just setting up some criteria and standards that actually if these are met it's best to kind of walk away um yeah. and, that, and that becomes a system in your business right like you know these are triggered we do this and if they 100%. don't do this they do this right yeah and that having and um, having mutually aligned values in your business mm. is so important talk to me about that what do you mean by that so if for example a company approaches me and says we're going to do a conference this year and um it's going to be our flagship event um and you know we've got this massive budget attached to it and you know it's a really big company and i'm thinking whoa getting these in the bag would be really cool i can use them as a testimonial yeah and then as we have a conversation i do a bit of work with them it actually turns out that they pay their women 50% 50% me- less than they pay the men doing the same jobs in their company and they don't have um, pay alignment and they don't have equal opportunities. I'm now thinking, mm, I'm not sure our companies, our, our visions are not mutually aligned. Mm. We To put my name with your company now could be an impingement for me. Um, yeah. You know, there's some certain companies that I just wouldn't work with um and that's purely because of reputation and what we stand for yeah so we just i think then when your name because starts to become valuable to you um and it starts to stand for something it's really important that all your clients are moving in the same direction you know we're working with progressive people we're working with people that are forward thinking that want to be change makers that want to make a difference in the world for the positive Mm, i i love that i uh I think saying true to your values is very, very powerful. Um, you, I know you've won multiple awards for diversity roles. I can remember seeing you on TV, actually. I can remember a few years ago, I saw I saw Lorna on TV, ITV to us, I believe, for national awards, which is amazing. And I know you're in, in your space and in your audience, you're a beacon of, of light for diversity and positive role models. Um, when, you, when you find out that a company isn't paying their women their their females for um the same amount of work they're doing as the guys in the in the company what is that what kind of emotions does that ignite in you and why Mm, mixed um anger always anger um inequality in all facets really grips my shit um you know because there's no re- rhyme or reason for it. I believe that we should be using the best people for the job and um, mm-hmm. people, regardless of where you went to school, how you grew up, um, you know, who you sleep with, it, it doesn't matter. Um, mm-hmm. it, it shouldn't matter whether someone needs a fag break or whether someone needs to take a break to pray in the middle of the day. Mm-hmm. It, none of that stuff matters. So to actually see the inequality, it's, it's just not what we're about. Um, and and if by me working with those people it condones the behavior yeah it says that I think that that's okay and actually and it's not it's totally not okay and and I do believe that everybody should be given the space to shine um in whatever that is that they want to do whether that's you know being the best refuse collector in the world or whether you're a CEO of a company having and bringing out the best in somebody um, is everything and I don't believe that you should have to um, hide who you are or hide part of who you are or, or not be able to live authentically in all aspects of your life 
Mm. And if you are going to work every day, knowing that the person sat next to you is earning more than you doing exactly the same job, that's soul destroying. And it's, it's, you're not valuing your people for the work that they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. If they've had the brass tax to go in and say, I'd like a pay rise, please. And you haven't got there yet because you're not that confident. Then the company should be enabling you to have those conversations. The company should be reviewing you on, you know, what you do bring to the party, allowing you the space to be excellent and then rewarding you for it. Sure. I completely agree. Do you believe or have seen, because I know, you know, I, when I first joined the job um, a long, long time ago, there was almost this discrimination against a Caucasian person um, that, you know, I feel like police actively want a specific type of person. So the organization looks di- more diverse. Um, so, you know, there's an example, there's a guy who I know who um, applied for the job three times. He's, he was a special, he's, you know, been interested in the police for a very, very long time. And his last application, he put down, he was gay. And could be that could be something else it could be his just his time but he got in and this guy is you know white caucasian guy you know straight uh, you know that kind of thing but there's almost like talks especially when i was in the job of <laughs> this almost like no we're looking for people who are more diverse to show that we're more diverse as an organization and sometimes i can think that is more of a negative towards those people who are born a certain way, like my friend who's white, who's straight, mm-hmm. um, but yet he didn't get the job based on his backgrounds. What, what do you think to that? Because there's almost that stigma as well. A hundred percent. And there's a there's a real thing for me around, I do agree with positive discrimination. So mm. there are some industries where we know that people of colour or women or, or whatever the uh, minority mm-hmm. characteristic is that are grossly un- underrepresented. Mm. policing being one of them um Mm -hmm. but there's a very real difference from helping people to achieve in those spaces and i call tick box recruitment you're not selecting the best people for the job but what really needs to happen is pre-application and if you're saying that you want to recruit people that are more diverse then go into those communities and figure out why those people are not applying for certain jobs is it because they've not been given the same opportunity in education is it because they actually don't know the jobs exist is it because um there's a stigma attached to it figure out what the fundamentals are and then empower those people to apply so you're still appointing the best people for the job but you're giving people equal access um there's a difference between equity and equality um and it's all around opportunity. So, yeah, um, yeah. I, d- I don't agree with tick box appointments because I don't think that does anybody any favours and you're effectively setting people up to fail. If, if you're expecting a certain standard of people and you're lowering that in order to get people in the door, then mm. you're just going to fail them further down the line. Mm. Whereas if you give everybody the equal opportunity and you're saying that, I'm going to help you get to this standard and this is what is expected of you. And then two people apply, then it's the best person for the job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm completely in alignment with that. I think, you know, whether you're straight, gay, a woman, um, a color of skin, whatever it may be, you're the best person for this position, this role, by all means, um, you know, you're going to get that position. You, you perform the best, you've shown the most evidence based on that um so that that doesn't really matter to me i think the 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 best person should wear i feel almost like what the job was doing at the time was like being proactively seeking people who are more diverse which is great they're trying to get more people to apply but also i don't i mean we'll never really know but there was a high percentage of people who you know were getting jobs from different diverse diverse backgrounds where i don't know it just seemed a lot more positive positive discrimination which kind of made people who were white and straight Mm -hmm. whatever just feel bad so it was good interesting to get your thoughts because obviously this is your space too you're an advocate of this and um you've won multiple awards which is uh which is cool Um, there's something really powerful sorry alex in a company saying actually we've recognized we're not as diverse as we could be yeah and then specifically going to different communities and saying 
we recognize there is talent in this area that we we're, we're not we don't have any part of yeah help us understand why people in your community don't apply to our jobs yeah and actually getting that is it's the same in business you know go to your audience and ask them what yeah. it is that they need yeah. um and there's a real strength in that but i think a lot of companies and businesses are too scared of getting it wrong mm. so then they don't do it in the right way right okay so it's almost like if they say something by accident they don't want to get in trouble with hr on that kind of thing got you okay okay i do feel i i, I get that in some regards um n- not so much for me but other business owners like it seems to be a world now where we're tre- treading on eggshells and you say something by mistake and you know this whole this whole what is a woman thing as an example like people mistaken identity and i feel like that is becoming more and more popular so i, I get i understand the the mindset in that because people can get it wrong just based on their upbringing and their background um it's not like they're doing it maliciously hopefully not but um i understand kind of their worry yeah. and concern about that and, and if you get it wrong apologize and correct yourself yeah there you go because and that's it that's you know that's the start and end and maybe educate yourself a little bit if yeah. if you've picked that up and you didn't realize then do something about it yeah absolutely yep yeah. um in your in your business Lorna what's kind of your your day-to-day what's what's your <laughs> what do you focus on as, as as the leader of your company what do you day-to-day uh where's your attention in the business depends what kind of week it is um okay. so some weeks um it is a, my primary role should be um uh, most of the time should be more about uh, making connections finding new clients mm. um producing content which is actually the stuff that i really enjoy yeah um putting what i know out there into the world and helping people do events better mm-hmm um yeah fills me up um and then it starts a conversation so I get to have a chat with some really interesting people then a lot of my week um is meeting with the team and empowering them um to do their jobs effectively and efficiently um I still do quite a lot of the hybrid events um and the streaming so some weeks um so in May we're in Dublin in July we're back in the US um so it will take probably three days to prep for those events um, and that's sorting all the kit out doing all the test runs for the kit that you know works but you have to do the checks every single time yeah um and then setting up and actually running those events um eventually I'll transition away from not doing as many of them and we'll get the team to do more of them Mm -hmm. um but they're all still learning and there's a lot of pressure to carry yeah um, so it's it's changing up. So if we've got a new member of the team, it'll be them shadowing me and showing them how to to run the events and what to do when. And if it's established member, it's them running it and me sitting in the background just to catch anything that needs catching. But it's it's everything. And, and we have got a really awesome team now. So I do less of the accounts. I do less of the bookkeeping. In fact, I don't do any. And mm. I get nagged at for not sending my receipts in, <laughs> um, yeah. which is good. That's what I need. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't manage my diary anymore. Somebody does that for me. So a lot of it is um, client contact, um, client conversation, keeping projects ticking over, um, and then content creation as much as possible. So I can hand it over to um our social events team and they make it look pretty and make it appear everywhere Mm. um so i didn't i don't have to do as much of the admin um now as we did um i'd like to pencil in a bit more thinking time yeah i think i spend so much time spinning around and racing around um actually reading learning a bit and thinking sitting and thinking about strategy Mm. and where the where the business is going i probably do that once a quarter um you know and it's a, a big session and a vision in session so actually i'd like to spend a bit more time in that space because it's where the energy goes and focus goes the energy flows right yeah so, yeah. so true um, yeah trying to get a step back from the business a little bit step back from the day-to-day um is really good what i mean that's an important thing to and i agree it, it step back from the business is, is very important and, and for those in the job as well like that's why you have like annual leave and stuff and i think when you are your own boss the annual leave goes out the window 
um, because you're, you're on this cycle, like something, you know, especially starting a business, you, you, you feel like you're working harder, but it doesn't feel like work because you don't have to clock on a shift or so forth. And you almost enjoy it a bit more, but for you, like, how do you relax? How do you, you know, high pressure situation, you've had a big event, you know, how do you relax, celebrate? How do you unwind? Good question. So for us introverts, and believe it or not, I am generally an introvert, I would much rather be on my own than with a load of people. But Mm. I kind of turn it on for events. So you're Mm. talking to everybody, you're being energetic, you're being really dynamic. So the next day, I'm literally on the floor, I can barely string a sentence together and make it coherent. I am that tired. Wow. So I now have to schedule in whole rest days Mm. after I've had um, a day long event because I'm exhausted. And if I keep going and don't put those days in, I'm one, I'm not effective anyway. Mm. Um, I'm pretty much a vegetable with a keyboard Um, (laughs) or or I'm just so knackered that I make mistakes. So it's really important to put those in the diary now um, and the team make sure that that happens and they know that I might have a day, an, an event on a Wednesday, but Thursday I'll pretty much be out of the picture as well. Oh, yeah. So relaxing, I think now is, is about experiences and because I don't have to book annual leave and in fact, no one in our team has to book annual leave. We don't have annual leave. It oh, was like one of the rules that I put in. I spent far too many hours in the old job counting up half an hour here and half an hour there and how much annual leave have I got left. I don't care. You need a holiday. Everyone needs a holiday. Put it in the diary, get someone to cover your work and it's done. No annual wow. leave. That's uh, that's powerful. So, so basically you can have unlimited annual leave. Yep. Um, just make sure your work's covered before you leave and let us, let us know when you actually do want to go away. Yep. Wow. Um, so, and it works. Um, being geeky, studies nationally have said that people that don't have allocated annual leave generally take less than their allocated amount anyway. So they generally take. So it works out well for us, but it also means that I don't have to spend hours doing that HR admin. Chris, yeah. Just don't do it. I suppose it almost feels like, well, it's like when there's limited supply of something that I have to use it, that kind of thing. But when there's like an abundance of it, it's like, I can use it when I want. It's that more, almost like more chilled around is, I suppose that's the psychology around it. Yeah. And it's meeting people in an adult space, you know, yeah. the team, somebody might text me and say, I've got a dentist appointment this afternoon and they're not asking for permission because I don't care that <laughs> in the nicest possible way. I yeah, do yeah. not care, but yeah. they're letting me know that if I text them, and ask them to do something it might not happen immediately that's all it is you know you shouldn't have to book half a day's leave to look after yourself yeah. or you know whatever to go to the yeah. gym just just do it it's like trust both ways you trust people not to say that the michael with yeah. you know annual leave and that creates a, an environment and a culture of trust right? yeah and they know that if i say you know i've dropped the ball on this team this needs to happen today mm. they all jump on it um, and they're happy to do it because they know that I'll do the same for them mm. so it's yeah um but yeah relaxing um lots of outside stuff lots of dog walks lots of champagne lots of gin not that much gin some gin <laughs> that makes me <laughs> sound makes me sound like I've got an issue um but I think being able to take time when it suits me um and be fully immersed in that time um is really important so not having half an ear on the emails or, you know, thinking, oh, I'll do this really quickly because then I can go and enjoy myself. It's actually, no, that is my relaxing time. That is my relaxing space. Mm-hmm. Um, I try not to work when my wife is off. So we actually have quality time together. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's unavoidable. Yeah. Like it was in the job. Yeah. But over time is because I want to and because I want to do it. And if I'm working at 11 o'clock at night, it's for me. And because I choose to, not because somebody says you can't go home yet because the work's not done. Got you. Let's go on to that, actually. So obviously you've come from the police force, 15 years in the job. Uh, I know when we first met, um, you were one of my first clients. It's just success. Um, and you were in a bad place um, mentally due to just the amount of workload stress, the certain situations you had, which you mentioned last on the podcast, uh, about a particular moment where you saw a, a dead body and you kept visualizing and dreaming about that dead body and you just kind of knew a change was needed. Um, have you ever thought about going back 
<laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and I think that that particular incident was a tipping point in many. Mm. Um, I think everybody's got a threshold. And when you tip over that threshold, and I worked it out the other day, I think I've seen somewhere in the region of 450 bodies in my time. And that's not normal. Oh, yeah. um, but but yeah, I think I'm fairly unemployable now just because I work the way that I work. I have really clear boundaries about what I'm willing to do and not willing to do. I think if somebody took me on, they'd have to be pretty trusting yeah. in working the way that I work. Mm. That's not to say that I don't work with people. I absolutely do, but I'm not sure I could work for a company anymore because I ask too many questions like, why? Why do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> well because well, we've always done it that way yeah but why it's stupid yeah you need yeah, to be yeah. at this meeting well why because the last time two times i've been you didn't ask me any questions so yeah it's not a good use of my time yeah no um, i'm completely with you i'm not sure anybody would want to employ me anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's interesting because like obviously you've been in you know you wasn't it wasn't in police now you've you've left and it's like do you ever like think you know because business is hard right and it's like you know um is sometimes your thought process can go there um but when you actually think of it you're like hell no because i'm exactly the same like i i literally when business is hard i think and this and this helps me create a gratefulness and a lot of gratitude in my life so i will put myself in a state of of, of pain on purpose so a lot of people they, they'll think um you know having this is good and having going after this house or going after this type of income is great and stuff like that but i actually think the most motivation you can gain is actually putting yourself mentally in a deep state of pain so for example what i would do put my, and this is a true story i'll put myself in a situation when business is hard and pissed off about things and frustrated i will put myself in a situation where i'll think about being back in the police right being back in the job and i think to myself right someone's going to be telling you when you go for break someone's telling you how much you're going to get paid when you can leave when you need to be here by when my future kids have got other birthdays and I can't get that off, I'm working every Christmas and new year. And I almost like get these emotions of like anger and frustration in, my, in, my, in myself. Mm -hmm. And then when I open my eyes after thinking that I'm like, Oh, but that's not my reality. Is it? That is, is, that's not my, my situation, but it could be Alex, mm -hmm. right? It could be. So stop being feeling sorry for yourself. Stop being a little bitch, get up and start doing the work and fixing the problems. Right. So, um, that has worked massively powerful for me. And, and I agree, like, I, 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 I believe I'm unemployable. Um, I just couldn't go back. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't restrict my life like that, knowing that this is over here. It's like, I'm not a wine drinker, but you know, I drink gin, right? Let's say you've got this bottle of gin over here and uh, it's cheap and not tasting good. And then you taste this one over here, which tastes amazing. And it's, oh, it's just delicious, right? You're not ever going to go back to the shitty one. You just can't because you've you've been adapted to this. It's almost like when you sit in a new car and go back to your old one. It's like, oh, I don't like this. Do you know what I mean? And and I think it was I think you posted something a couple of years ago that really stuck with me. And I and I go back to it time and time again. And it's choosing your hard. Mm. Everything is hard. Mm. Working in the job you hate is hard. Mm. Starting your own business is hard. Yeah. everyone has shitty days everyone feels like giving up at yeah. some point no matter what they're doing but it's about choosing what do you want as hard you know being overweight and uncomfortable and unhealthy is hard going to the gym every day is hard nobody's got it easy very few people in this world are kicking back saying i've got no problems even multi-billionaires oh, have yeah. still got problems Bloody hell yeah so it's, it's about choosing your heart and what you're willing to put up with and also what you're willing to do about it mm. that's a frustrating one that i have to deal with a lot it's like people complain about their lives but they don't do anything about the complaining and you're right in what you're saying you you can choose this route but you also choose this route and i feel like there's a preconception that this is the way my life is and I'm helpless and I'm a victim. And as a result, people just don't take the action they needed. I'm looking for the book. It's Jeff Olson, isn't it? Slight Edge. Slight Edge, um, yes. That actually yeah. everything is a choice and it's binary. Yeah. Either you are actively moving towards the thing that you want or yeah. you're not. And if you're not, you're actively moving away from the thing by the default of not making a choice. 
Yeah. You either are in this direction or you're not. And that is true for everything. Like, so you mentioned health and fitness there. You're either declining your health and you're adding on weight or actually you're maintaining your weight and increasing it and getting better relationships. You're either, you know, not giving that the attention it needs. You're not going on date nights enough. You're not spending quality time or you are, and it's getting better and better and better with your finances. Exactly the same process. You're spending money. You're going in more debt. You're not mm -hmm. accelerating your income or you are. It goes in every facet of life. Every decision, every little decision that you make, you either yeah. are or you're not. There you are, look. There's the there's there's the coasters people. That's I it. Had such a profound effect on my life that I had coasters around the house, which my fiance doesn't still like. So they're still in my uh, still in my office. <laughs> um, Lorna, what do you want to be known for? Like, what's the end goal for you? Oh, that's good. So I want two things. I want the business to be the go-to place mm. for hybrid events globally mm -hmm. um, when people think about running hybrid events they look to us first so when you say when we when we say as humans let me check online we actually or say google it mm -hmm. when someone thinks of someone going online or a hybrid event they go my oh my yeah yeah got you okay so that's the business um i there's something burning in me to give back mm. i would like to spend eventually lots of time educating young people that there are more options than leave school get a job or leave school and go to university yeah actually entrepreneurship and running your own business is a huge part of that mm -hmm. um and i just don't think people get exposed to it um early enough or see it as an option early enough mm. um, and it tends to be kids of entrepreneurs that know about it um, and everybody else gets funneled down this line of traditionalness. I don't think, I don't regret, I don't believe in regrets. I think we all make decisions for the reason we make decisions at the time and we all live and learn from them. Mm. But if entrepreneurship were open to me at the age of 18, maybe I would have done stuff differently. Mm. Um, so I'd love to be giving back to people that are just starting out and and so that we're not in a position of saying you hate your job and when you're 30 40 years old do something different you actually are planning a life that you enjoy from the get-go mm. i love that it's very very powerful um hey lorna being in business and and you know the life you've built and stuff um are you happy yes okay. on balance yeah. Yes. <laughs> and how, how would you how do you know you're happy? Oh gosh. Um a sense of freedom. Mm. Um yes, I still have obligations. Yes, I still have things that I have to do. Mm. Um, but they are all obligations because I've chosen to put them my, in my own path. Mm. So there's a freedom in that. Um mm. a sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Um, is very large um, yeah and when I looked at my vision board last year and pulled off loads of stuff because I've already done them that's you know that that is actualization you know mm. that's the reaching the top of the Maslow's hierarchy pyramid that's mm. becoming everything that you wanted to be and that's seeing that progress seeing that constant moving towards the person that i want to be and living the life that i want to live can only be can only make you happy if you're getting the things that you've asked for there's nothing else it's there there's you've planned a life you've envisaged a life and it's happening all around you because you've made it happen i love that very very powerful and one of the kind of last things i want to ask before uh departing the podcast is if someone else is in your situation, like, you know, from where you were in the job, being stressed and anxious and having a real bad time and feeling like a bit, you know, um, stuck, what advice would you, because I know you you left, so you left the job and resigned, that was enough was enough, and then you built. Of course, you don't recommend that, and I don't recommend that, but you had to go. But for those who have the opportunity to build a business on the side, because they're having a crap time in the job, but they're still fearful and doubtful and worried and concerned. What, what bit of advice, what part of advice would you give to that person? 
I would start to say, look, just look outside of the situation that you're in. Mm. Start to open up your mind to the possibility of opportunities. Mm. You don't even have to do anything about it. But I think a lot of the time, all of us are so tunnel focused and looking at the step in front of ourselves all the time mm. that you don't actually realize there's a whole world of other stuff open to you. Mm whether that's a completely different job in a completely different industry or setting up in business on your own or with a team or with somebody else. If you're not open to the possibility, you're never going to see it. Mm. Um, and then being brave enough to make tiny steps. Mm -hmm. And nobody is saying that you go from the job to a multi-million pound business overnight. Very yeah. few people get that. Yeah, yeah. But actually being able to say, yes, actually, I'm going to give up one of my rest days to go on this course. Yeah. Yes, actually, I'm going to give up two hours of Netflix tonight to work on my business. Making those tiny, uncomfortable changes mm. means that you almost get fitter. You yeah. almost become um, more able to adapt. Like when you go for a one mile run, the next yeah. time you do it and you do two miles, it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. The same is in, in business. When you do something scary, the next time you do it, it's not as scary. Mm. And it means that you can do something bigger the next time. You build up this resilience, this tolerance for being afraid to fail. Generally, that's the end of that sentence. Yeah. I am afraid, but nothing bad happened. Or I did fail and nobody died. Yeah. You know, this uh, is, this is business. Something. Ultimately, yeah. nobody died. If you yeah. make a wrong decision yeah. and something doesn't work out, okay figure yeah. it out learn again and go again nobody died lots of people in the job can't say that if they make a wrong decision and something goes wrong somebody could die yeah you know, yeah all the jobs are yeah yeah so, so business is not that scary but you need to do some of the small difficult things yeah so that your um, animal brain can calm down and realize that it's really not that scary yeah and open your eyes to the opportunities yeah, I think, yeah, you're right in what you're saying. People build it up to this big, this big life-changing decision. And the reality is if something really goes wrong in terms of your business, no one's coming to sack you. No one's coming to fire you. And the chances are you're going to end up in exactly the same position, what you're currently in, which is the police force. Um, and I think people confuse job security with financial security. Most people want financial security, right? They want to feel comfortable. There's money in the bank. They're saving. There's low debt. They want that. Everyone wants that, right? Yep. But I think you know, the job and other public sector roles is that what they actually get is job security um, based on not being made redundant. But if that means they don't get financial security, which is what they really want, it's going to make a negative impact. So I think it's important not to confuse the two and actually yeah. seek for financial security over job security. No one really wants a job, but everyone wants financial security. So yeah, yeah very valid points. Lorna, you have been an absolute inspiration. Uh, for many, many years. Uh, I know you're a coach now at Shift Success, helping our clients to start and scale their business. I was going to say to you, we'll need to wrap up shortly because I've got yeah. an accountability <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have, look at the time. Um, thank you so much for your time. Inspiration, as always. Um, thank you for all that you do at Shift Success too. Um, and also, you know, I know seeing you grow for over the years has been a journey. You've gone on a journey and I have no doubt that you're going to reach your goals and that vision that you want for yourself. So thank you for your time. And uh, I wish you all the best in the future. And I can't wait to uh, see you grow to new heights. Thanks, Alex. No worries.